good evening. I'm just going to give it one more moment to let a couple more people join and then we'll get started. All right, good evening everyone and welcome to the ARC GAP webinar. We appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedules to learn a little bit more about our programs. So before we really jump into things, I'd like to go over a little bit of housekeeping for those of you who are new to webinars. We have put everyone's phones on mute so that you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. We do have many people on the line this evening, so that helps to keep background noise to a minimum. However, this is meant to be an interactive experience, so if you do have a question, you will notice a box on your webinar dashboard that's titled questions or chat. If you do have a question during the presentation, just type it into the box and my colleague Mara will get back to you with an answer. If it is a question that many people are asking, Mara will pass it on to me and I will go over it at the end of the presentation. Just as a note too, I am going to cover a lot this evening, so I do encourage you to hold your questions to the end as hopefully I will answer those during the presentation. All right, so we do have people from all over the country joining us tonight, so welcome everyone. Our presentation should last about 50 minutes and hopefully by the end you'll have a much better sense of the types of programs that we offer here at ARC. So my name is Margot Brookfield and I am one of the directors here at ARC GAP. A little bit more about me, I have been with ARC for over seven years now. I started out as a trip leader in 2015, including leading our Latin America and East Africa GAP semester programs before transitioning into the office in January of 2017. Since joining the office, I have had the opportunity to direct a number of our programs, including our South America, Himalaya, East Africa, Pacific Islands, Central Caribbean, and Northwest GAP semester programs. Building, discounting, and designing these programs has been a true joy and passion of mine. And on the GAP team with me here at ARC are Emily Rosser, Sierra Durkee, and Alex Morton. So Emily is a GAP director and is in charge of our Southeast Asia, Western Mediterranean, East Africa, and Hawaii GAP semesters. She has led two global GAP year programs, um, which were nine-month-long semester, or not even semesters, nine-month-long programs in Asia, Africa, and Latin America for another GAP year company in the past and is really passionate about this growing field. Sierra is another of our directors. She is in charge of our South America and Pacific Islands GAP semesters. She is a former ARC GAP instructor in South America and also used to direct summer programs for ARC. And then lastly here we have Alex, who is another GAP director in charge of our Western U.S., Himalaya, and Central Caribbean programs. And she is a former GAP year instructor with us, having led more programs than any other GAP instructor ever with six semesters under her belt. So she is a great resource if anyone is looking at those programs. So we are speaking with you tonight from our headquarters in Bend, Oregon. We moved here about five years ago from our previous location in the Bay Area where we were for roughly 25 years. So this has been a really inspiring place to work for us and the outdoor adventurous environment around us does prove to help, help us create some pretty amazing programs around the world. And we are a small mom and pop type company here so you can reach out to any of us, including our executive director, George Hoke, simply by calling our office. So at this point, we are entering our 41st year, um, or it's our 40 year anniversary, 41st summer. Our first programs left in the summer of 1983 and were run by our founder, Lisa Halstead. So if you'll notice, we do call ourselves ARC. The R comes from the fact that we were originally called Adventures Rolling Cross Country. Um, but our, country, our, our company has expanded over the years and we did drop the rolling, but kept the R. People knew us as ARC. Uh, not ACK. We thought that that sounded a little bit better than ACK. So uh, as we evolved, we did change that. But originally, Lisa organized a small group of students with one other leader and packed a van full of, um, you know, leaving New Jersey where, where they were at the time and drove across the U.S. to experience the wilderness areas of the West and what happens with, you know, team building and group dynamics and personal growth and leadership in this unique environment. So we have evolved over the years, as I mentioned. We now travel to 22 different countries around the world 
all while maintaining the founding themes that really made our program so successful in the beginning and are really what our programs are all about. So over the years, I think we've been, it, you know, we have incredible legitimacy within the, the larger market of both summer and gap year programs due to our longstanding history with nearly 40 years under our belt um, of running programs. So our mission is significant. It is to provide unique, life-changing educational experiences in places rarely visited and situations seldom experienced. So I'm going to dig into this a little bit more to give you a bit more context of what that really means for us. So in terms of unique, ARC does spend a great deal of time establishing relationships with organ people and organizations all over the world to enable these experiences for our students. And our idea behind that is that we really do want this to be something that a teenager has never experienced before. It is not a tour or a vacation. It is a chance to go places and see things that many people only dream of. So this might mean attending a Maasai wedding in Tanzania or helping out on a Costa Rican farm or taking care of your own elephant while at a sanctuary in Thailand, things like that. You know, we really do want those to be unique experiences that one might not find if they were traveling on their own or um, in more of a, a tourism type of a capacity. And within that, within these unique experiences, they, we want them to be life-changing for our students. We want them to be more than just kind of going through the motions of traveling through these regions, but digging deeper and questioning things. And, you know, we'll talk about this more with the educational curriculum, but really altering your worldview or expanding your worldview while on this important time in your life, this gap year experience. So really the idea behind that is that they are life-changing experiences. So educational, a great deal of learning does go into these semesters, and we will discuss this in more detail later on in the presentation. But these semesters are about experiencing cultural differences or learning about um, you know, issues facing certain communities that we're visiting or learning about solutions to climate change or to hunger or whatever it may be as, as you're traveling through these places um, and digging more deeply into the various themes that are a part of our programs, looking at public health or education systems and such. So um, again, going through more than just the motions of traveling, but really digging deeper. So places rarely visited and situations seldom experienced. I'm going to go a little bit more, more in depth into this, but it is all really still tied with that uniqueness. But um, places on the globe that you might not typically find yourself visiting. And these are really critical elements that we take into consideration as we're forming these semesters. By the end of the program, we want our students saying, gosh, can you really believe everything that we've done and accomplished during this time? The next up is our group size. So our groups are typically eight to 13 or 14 students max per group, which we do find to be a nice, small and intimate group size. This is really important for us because we want to make sure that the group is not so large that students are lost in the shuffle or that our groups are too invasive when they're visiting local or more rural communities, things like that. And this is your opportunity to have a significant experience with your group. When you get to know one another on that more fam familial type level, it does really become instrumental to the overall experience and learning for students. And frankly, for most students, the group ends up being a pretty big highlight of their experience overall. Our age range of our students is 17 to 20 years old. So um, a student cannot turn 21 while on a program with us. And the reason behind this too is that we really do feel that this, this age range does keep students in a similar place in life um, versus being older and maybe done a few years of college and now taking one of our GAP programs. Um, you know, some of our students maybe have graduated early or have taken a semester or a year of college and are now transferring or taking a, a, a mid-college GAP year, things like that. Um, but we do require them to be within that 17 to 20 range. And I would say the majority of our students have just graduated high school, but we certainly get some on both ends as well. So a big thing about, you know, kind of our criteria and what we're looking for in students is we want students that want to be here. Um, you know, we want them to want to be a part of this particular experience. And ARC is not a program, you know, overall, we are not a program for students who are coming out of a youth at risk environment or who maybe need more, you know, we're not a mental health or a therapeutic program. So if students potentially need more support in that realm, then we want to make sure that they're in a space where they can really receive that support adequately. Um, but rather, this is, this is, we want students who are ready to buy into this experience and, and push outside of their, their comfort zones. Um, it is a longer period of time, you know, two and a half months, and we want to make sure that students are here for the right reasons. And that's why we do have an application process that students go through complete with a detailed application, two to three outside references, one academic and one character, and then a mental health reference for anyone who has seen a therapist in the last four years. 
Um, to be clear, that does not bar you from admission, but we do have another reference form that you would, would fill out, and then a subsequent interview to be admitted into our program. So a little bit more about our instructors. So our programs do have two instructors who are typically in their late 20s, I would say, um, more often than not, with significant experience in country, if it's international or if applicable language experience, particularly for our two programs in Latin America, our instructors will speak Spanish. Um, but overall, our instructors are passionate about education. They're motivating. They know how to run safe programs for young adults and how to connect with them. And they really play an important role throughout the semester, serving as mentors, teachers, big brother or sister or a friend, even a parent or, or guide or, you know, guidance in need be. Um, for training purposes, we do require that all of our instructors have completed the Wilderness First Responder course, which is a rigorous 80-hour medical training course that is one step below an EMT. They do also have about, you know, they go through our summer staff training, which is roughly eight days, and they go through a seven-day trip-specific prep with us here, uh, you know, prior to heading out on the gap semester. So they do have a significant amount of experience prior to heading into the field with students. But most importantly, they are dynamic people with a proven reputation and experience working for ARC and who serve a really important role for our students during the program. Just a little bit more. Here's our, one of our recent cohorts of instructors. Moving on here, so we want to chat a little bit about our partners. Um, so we are often asked, you know, how are you able to run safe programs in East Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, et cetera? You know, how do you have these intimate connections with people? And, and we feel it's important to note that we have developed and nurtured and really maintained these relationships with our in-country partners over the years. Um, a lot of that has been through either long-standing partnerships or we, we do go and we get to scout and vet our, our partners and locations that students are traveling to. But we trust our partners to help us create these dynamic itineraries that are not only impactful, but also flexible and find projects that are going to be the most important that they can be for students. And it is these relationships that help to really make our programs what they are. So next up, I want to chat a little bit more about safety. And of course, it's important when you're considering sending your student or, or if you're looking yourself, if you're looking to go on an adventure of this, of this link to think about, okay, what if something happens? What infrastructure is in place? And we are very proud of our safety record here and do attribute it to being proactive in the field and to hiring mature, responsible leaders who are required to go through an intensive, that intensive 80-hour medical training to ensure that they can create that safe environment for students and act appropriately in the case of an emergency. So we do have a dialed infrastructure of extensive safety protocols in place. If so, if something did occur, um, you know, and more often than not, if it's an international program, it might be traveler sickness or something, and a student needs to go to a clinic for that. If they do, then we ensure that our students are always taken to clean and safe cl clinics, um, often with the help of our in-country partners to determine what is the best place to take our students. They are always accompanied by one of our instructors. We do also keep families in the loop. Um, throughout that time, we do have an after-hours emergency contact if needed and a set communication protocol between the office, instructors, families, as well as our in-country partners to make sure that everyone is on the same page should something like that occur. All right, so next I'd like to just chat about the programs that we offer here. Um, so this is a nice map that sort of goes through the, the various places that we go. Um, the green dots are our, are our summer programs, while the blue dots are our, our gap semester programs. There is a lot of overlap between those locations as well, as you might see through from this, but I'm um, going to go into a little bit more about, um, about the different programs that we offer here. So we do have our summer programs for teenagers. So those are for 7th through 12th grade students. Um, we do also have custom programs for schools that could be any length of time, any ages really. But those are sort of our three categories of programs. And then we do have our gap semester programs, which are offered both fall and spring, they are the same length. They're two and a half month long semesters. And as you can see, we have, you know, East Africa, North Africa, Europe, Southeast Asia, the Himalayas, Oceania, Latin America, and the Caribbean for our program. So next I would love to just chat about like, what is a gap year? Um, and, and some uh, more information about what this could look like for you if you're looking at taking one. Um, so it is something that is has been common around the world, often more common in places like Europe or maybe Australia in the past, but has recently picked up significantly in the United States. And what it's meant to be is a natural break between high school and college. So an opportunity, and it's, this is the quote-unquote traditional gap year. Obviously, you can take a gap year any time in your life, 
mid-career gap year, post-college gap year, a retirement gap year, like whatever you want. But this, that what we're talking about is this between high school and college period. And that's an opportunity for students to really gain maturity and perspective, awareness, to, to learn leadership skills, um, to dabble in things that they might want to major in or study or career paths, things like that. A great opportunity to just unplug from the everyday classroom and reboot in a way that's much more experiential. Um, you know, is experiential education being such a big part of that gap year. Um, students often gain a better sense of identity, self-confidence, and ability to connect with real-world experiences. Um, it might reignite a passion for learning, um, you know, if you're feeling burnt out after that high school experience. And as I mentioned, look at different career paths as you're, as you're moving on. And it also it allows students the opportunity to connect with readings or things they maybe learn in school and apply it in a way that, that is more applicable and experiential and use that going forward. Um, so within each program, there is a framework comprised of five different pillars, as we call them here. So we have education, cultural immersion, leadership, project-based learning, and adventure. Um, and these really are the foundation and essence of our semester. So to dig into this a little bit more, the educational curriculum is a big part of our programs. They are, as I mentioned, meant to be educational opportunities for students. But a big distinguishing factor for us is that these are not meant to be academic semesters. They are not meant to be like school with assignments and readings and tests, et cetera. But they are meant to be an experiential educational opportunity. So over the course of the semester, students are looking at six different global themes that are listed here. And every project that they're doing during the program is meant to look at one or two of those global themes. So these are environment and conservation, the movement of peoples, literacy and education, public health, indigenous rights and histories, and then social justice. So a big piece of this too is there is um, you know, not only are there the experiential, like, hands-on projects that are a part of the program, so any, like, itinerary piece that you might see or highlight of a program, those are often what we refer to as projects, where students are um, getting those hands-on experiences that relate to these themes. Um, and each of our projects is meant to look at one or two of these, of these global themes. So through these local organizations that we're working with, students might do research or conduct interviews or join ongoing projects. Um, they spend time working alongside their peers as well as community members to gain a deeper understanding of the theme. And it, it's really meant to enhance that experiential learning. And the rest is sort of discussion-based. So students are having discussions, thinking more critically about what they're learning and experiencing. We do have something called a course reader, which is what's um, pictured here. I mean, they're joking, holding them upside down, but those are the course readers, which is a series of short articles about each of the projects that students are reading about throughout the semester just to learn a bit more about what they might be encountering during the projects of the program. Um, to supplement that, students might not just, not just reading articles, students might also be listening to podcasts, uh, watching TED Talks or documentary films and things like that to kind of further engage that um, learning and con context for the projects. And then the final piece of this is the Capstone Passion Project, which does allow students the opportunity to um, dig into one topic or theme that is of most interest to them. And it doesn't have to be one of those six themes that we just mentioned, but just something that they're excited to be learning more about. And then they research that throughout the course of the semester. And ideally, this is not through internet research. Um, ideally, it is, we want them to be engaging further with the places that they are. So that might mean conducting interviews or observations, you know, working with the, the people, um, yeah, working with our partners along the way. And then basically they come up with uh, a presentation that they give at the end of the semester that can take any creative form that they want. So that could be a photo, you know, a photo essay, a compilation of interviews. Um, they might be doing a cookbook or, um, gosh, we've seen all sorts of creative things, slam poems, <laughs> paintings, anything that really suits their interests best. And they present that at the end of the semester. So just a bit more about the hands-on projects. This is a really a major component of the program. We work with organizations that are already established projects that are locally driven, so really focused on sustainable projects there and making sure that we are, you know, that it's a mutually beneficial exchange, that we are lending a hand, learning, maybe contributing resources. So our students are given the opportunity to really be a part of that project and see what communities and organizations are trying to accomplish. Um, and it, it, yes, it's always projects that are already in place. For cultural immersion, this is something that is really experienced every day on our programs. It's why students often take a gap semester to experience and, and, and immerse themselves in cultures that they are unfamiliar with and broaden their own perspectives. 
Um, so I, I, this is more applicable, I would say, on our international programs. There's definitely some of this on our domestic programs. But on the international programs, this might be accomplished through home stays, group community stays, or participating in local, you know, daily traditions and activities. And then our leadership development curriculum. This is a really big part of the program as well. We want students to be stepping up into both formal and informal leadership positions throughout the program so that they are, um, you know, growing in their leadership, learning about giving and receiving feedback, learning about effective conflict resolution techniques, all of that sort of thing. But in addition, they serve as leaders of the week is what we call them, where students are with another student. They are co-leaders of the week for that period of time. And then they receive feedback about that. They're setting goals. They're doing activities to understand their leadership style, um, team building initiatives, and things like that. And this sort of culminates in what we call our student planned module, which is about two thirds of the way through the program typically. And that's an opportunity for students to basically come together. They are given parameters and a budget and they have to plan what they're doing um, within, you know, yeah, within parameters, of course, the instructors still go with them. All the same, you know, rules and expectations apply, but they have to figure out, you know, how, where they're going, how they're getting there, what they're eating, what they're going to be doing, where they're staying, kind of, kind of all those logistics. So they're not only learning how to plan uh, the team building part of it, they're learning how to plan independently for travel. And they're also learning how to budget. I mean, often, you know, if you're traveling on a backpacker's budget, that is going to, that's, you know, you have to be a little bit thrifty with things. And so students are learning all of those skills through this experience. So most common, you know, feedback from parents after a program is they do notice increased confidence in their student and, and how they feel about themselves after, and is partly attributed to this leadership development curriculum. And lastly is adventure. You know, it's a gap year. You should have some fun. So this is certainly a piece of it. Um, this might look like taking surfing lessons in Costa Rica or going whitewater rafting in Patagonia or, you know, going hiking or backpacking um, in the mountains. It might mean getting scuba certified in Fiji. Um, things like that are sort of part of that adventure. And I would also say what falls into this is some of the major landmarks one might visit, whether that's Machu Picchu or um, national parks in the United States or things like that also would fall into this realm. Okay, so just a little bit more information about COVID and how this has been impacting our programming. At this point in time, we are sort of updating things as it gets closer to each season in terms of what our COVID protocols are. We are still requiring our students and instructors to be vaccinated. Um, before joining one of our programs, but um, you know, our, basically our on the program regulations will will differ depending on you know as things get closer to each program. But we have felt that we've been able to really successfully and safely run programs throughout the pandemic. And depending on what season it is that you're looking at, feel free to reach out with any questions about those. Um, another thing to mention is that we do. Um, follow whatever local guidelines are in place. So sometimes we are sort of at the mercy of whatever the local COVID regulations might be in a country that you're traveling to. Um, but some important things to note, the fall deadline. So if you apply for the program, and we will talk about the application process, there is an $800 deposit to hold your space on the program. If you withdraw after June 1st for a fall program, um, I'm sorry, if you withdraw before June 1st for a fall program, only $300 of that is refundable, after which it is non-refundable. Similar for spring, that deadline is November 1st. If for some reason we have to cancel your program after that refund date, but before it begins, you have the opportunity to either receive a full refund on all payments made, switch to the following semester of that program, or switch to another semester that is running that program. So we are still trying to be as flexible as we can with folks. Um, and as I mentioned, our, our protocols on program will be updated and finalized closer to the start date of each program, but we have been adapting and being flexible since the start of this and we'll continue to do so. We've been doing it for 40 years and we are ready to continue that trend. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into some of the fun details about each of our programs. I will just as a reminder that this is um, an overview. There's so much more information on the website. So we're just gonna go through some highlights of each of the programs and then as we, you know, if you're looking for information, you can always check out our website or speak with the director. So I'm going to start with our Hawaii program. This is both a fall and spring semester program that travels to Oahu, Maui, and the Big Island. Here are some of the highlights listed here, but we're gonna go a little bit more in depth into those as well next. So we've got surfing. Um, there are multiple surf lessons on, on this program. I think Emily Emily's in charge of this program. It's typically one per island, um, but st students also are getting to dig into some habitat. 
um, restoration projects, learning more about it. Marine conservation is definitely a big piece of this. Um, on the program, learning about invasive species, native plant, um, you know, re either reforestation or um, just reintroducing or, or helping with, um, you know, more native plants in the region. And also working with the island's only industrial composter. So definitely that environment and conservation is a big theme overall on our Hawaii program. Um, next up, students are looking at food security and remediation techniques. So they actually get to partner with the University of Hawaii Maui College's experimental aquaponics farm, um, which has been a really cool opportunity for students in the past to really dig into that. Um, learning about the college's community vegetable garden and sustainability through small scale local farming. Um, and they get to learn about both traditional Hawaiian methods of farming, um, as well as some experimental new methods. And then they're also working in a native dry forest land. Um, and this is a, a photo students have worked at a beekeeping farm in the past as well here. Um, so really just learning about all of those sustainability and, and farming techniques in Hawaii. Next up, we have Volcanoes National Park Service as well as Mauna Kea. So for this project, students are volunteering within the National Park, working with local experts, um, and they're looking at volcano ecology, um, learning about the history of the Hawaiian Islands and the volcanic activity here. If lucky, they are going to get to see that iconic moment where, um, you know, hot lava meets the ocean. I know it depends on time of year and they might not always get to see it, but kind of, you know, witnessing that volcanic activity, obviously from a safe distance. <laughs> Um, they're also working with experts in the park to remove an invasive native or invasive ginger that's in the park, doing invasive species removal, and then traveling up Mauna Kea, um, which actually from, I think from the base at the bottom of the ocean to the peak, it's the tallest peak in the world, but above sea level it is not. But it's a, it's a very large peak. There's often snow at the top and students get to, you know, drive over that and, and experience it. Next up on our Hawaii Gap is the uh, fish pond restoration project and organic taro farming. Um, so students are getting to help with the restoration of a 400-year-old fish pond. Um, again, removing invasive plants, learning about, um, you know, fish, uh, yeah, <laughs> juvenile fish and caring for them, um, coconut propagation. And then also on the taro farm, this is a, a traditional Hawaiian um, practice so students are getting to dig into that learn about that a bit more as well so I would say this program definitely has a bigger focus on environment conservation as well as marine um, marine science and then lastly we have our manta ray snorkel and scuba certification so students do get scuba certified on this program that's a four-day certification process where they're doing some e-learning ahead of time kind of learning the basics of scuba and then um, doing some practical skills in a pool as well as in the ocean which is exciting um, and then students also get to go diving with manta rays, um, which is a really cool experience, or kind of one of those, I'd say, once in a lifetime sort of experiences for our students. All right, next up we have our Western US program. As you might have seen in the past, we had it uh, a Northwest and a Southwest program that were both domestic that were created during COVID. And we're very excited that we've kind of combined the best of both, I would say, into this Western US program. So. A lot of ground and territory is covered on this one. Um, this is our only mainland domestic program. So I'm going to go through some of the main projects here. So we have some time in the Tetons as well as Yellowstone National Park. So some time spent in Jackson. This is students are kind of doing orientation, visiting the National Park, doing some hiking, um, really incredible, yeah, alpine lakes and, and hiking trails here um, sort of to start off the semester. Students are also um, partnering with the Teton Raptor Center learning just a little bit more about like conservation issues in the area of the Tetons. Um, some, it actually, there's a lot of themes that touch on all of our six global themes, I would say, in the Tetons. And then students are also spending time in Yellowstone National Park. And this is a really awesome project where basically students are partnering with local specialists to do experiential education in the park, but they also, um, you know, are, they work with students, but they're also experts in wildlife. And so students are learning about bison, gray wolves, and grizzly bears. Um, learning about tracking these animals, seeing them in the park in their natural habitat, understanding the barriers to conservation for them, as well as sort of touching on um, just overall preservation of public lands is a big theme on this program. Next up, we have our Wolf Sanctuary as well as the Wilderness First Responder course. So at the Wolf Sanctuary, basically this is um, a sanctuary for wolves that have not been able to be reintroduced into the wild. So they are more or less domesticated at this point. 
Um, and so students are learning about kind of building upon it, which is really cool, that project in Yellowstone, um, looking more at wolf conservation, um, you know, what are some of the issues that, we've, that gray wolves are facing in the United States being, you know, they've been eradicated from certain environments, they've been reintroduced into certain environments, so learning more about that. Um, students get to go rock climbing at the Colorado National Monument. The Wolf Sanctuary is in Colorado. And then they also get to do the Wilderness First Responder course, which I know I mentioned our instructors are required to have. So students actually get to do that course on this program. Um, it is an 80-hour course. They do get a lot of practical skills that are super important for anyone recreating in the outdoors. You'll see a scenario here. They're doing night scenarios with symptoms and um, what they call the moulage, the kind of fake blood. You get scenarios and you have to um, use your skills to uh, stabilize a patient or make sure that they can get for further medical support. So really, really awesome certification. Next up, we have a bunch of national parks that the students will be visiting on this program um, throughout. So I know I mentioned the Tetons and Yellowstone. They will also be uh, visiting a number of national parks in Utah. Um, you know, they might go to Arches, Canyonlands, Zion. Um, a bunch of those are included here, as well as, um, you know, the Grand Canyon. So a lot of famous and iconic landmarks where students are getting to just explore, um, learn about, again, public land, you know, conservation, and do a lot of hiking. So definitely get ready to hike on this program. Next up, we have Cataract Canyon Rafting. So students get to go on a multi-day rafting trip, which is super fun. You like set up camp on the banks of the river, swim during the day. Um, it's a really fun experience. They get to learn about water rights issues in the Southwest. Um, and then they work with an organization called Design Build Bluff that do eco-building projects for tiny homes. Um, so also learning about housing security and such. And then also visiting Bear Sears Monument. So students are getting, getting their hands dirty here as well. Next up, we have our Borderlands Immigration um, Project as well, and then finishing in Hawaii. So this is a mixture of Arizona and Hawaii, but students are getting to learn about immigration reform and initiatives on the southern border um, through a week-long delegation workshop. So working with organizations that are, that are active in this area um, and just learning more about immigration issues at the border. Um, super important and relevant issue for us here in the United States. And then students also get to go to, to Hawaii. They do finish on the on Hawaii on the Big Island. They do the same volcanoes, National Park Service and Project and Exploration that I mentioned in Hawaii Gap, as well as getting their scuba certification at the end. So this is another program that has two certifications, really awesome. All right, now we are moving on to our international semesters, starting with our Central Caribbean program. I think I forgot to mention that the Western US program is a fall only semester. Um, due to weather in the region, uh, Central Caribbean is a fall and spring program, so you can do that either semester. So we're going to go dig into some highlights here. So this program travels to Costa Rica, Panama, and Belize. Um, and basically in Costa Rica, the students do a Spanish language school. Um, they are in homestays. They are digging into Spanish language um, at an accredited school, so they're broken up into beginner, intermediate, and advanced courses. Um, so really digging into Spanish language, not only through those classes, as well as through their um, homestay families at night, which is great. And it's on the coast. They can go, you know, surfing or swimming during the day, play volleyball on the beach, those sorts of things. Really fun experience. And then students also do a ranch stay at a, at a ranch that we've been working with in the highlands of Costa Rica for gosh, 25 years now, I think. So students are learning about, again, kind of sustainability, farming, helping out around the farm. Um, it's a really rural, very small community, so also sort of learning more about um, rural life in Costa Rica and the Highlands. Next up, we have our sea turtle conservation um, project, as well as our Belize jungle immersion. So this is where this both fall and spring get to do sea turtles. It just differs where. It's in Costa Rica if it's fall, it's in Belize if it's spring. Um, but students are basically, for both of these projects, they're learning about turtle conservation. They are, um, and if they, yeah, it, when it alters too, we have alternate projects. Um, that are still conservation oriented in both places based on the, the migration of the turtles at that time of year. But basically either way, students are getting to patrol the beaches at, light, at night looking for nesting sea turtles. If lucky enough to see one, they get to catch the eggs, plant, you know, go um, put them in the hatchery where they can be monitored and kept safe. Um, here students are pictured making, you know, signs for the beach about keeping the beach clean or protecting the turtles and things like that. So um, really cool project. And also if lucky students do get to uh, if there are hatchlings while they're there, they get to release them into the ocean and watch them kind of waddle out to the to sea. It's a really special experience. Next up, we have the Monteverde Institute. This is still in Costa Rica. 
Um, this is an awesome project where students are learning about a variety of different sustainability efforts in the cloud forest of Costa Rica. So this might mean animal conservation, it might mean native plants, um, you know, native, native species planting, things like that. It, it, there's a lot that goes into that project, but students are really getting to dig into that there in a really hands-on way. And then students also get to some of the fun stuff in Costa Rica. They get to go rafting on the Pacuari River on a multi, like an overnight excursion on the Pacuari, which is very fun. And then they also get to take surf lessons on the coast of Costa Rica. Next up, we're heading to Panama for these next um, projects. We do have our um, rural Community Health Initiative. This is a super cool project where students are getting to learn about these pop-up clinics that are set up in the, the rural um, Bocas del Toro, somewhat remote islands of Bocas del Toro off the coast of Panama. Um, so students are not giving medical care, they are helping just more with administrative tasks, but really getting to learn more about um, healthcare access in this region. And then also just spending some time in the Bocas del Toro sort of archipelago. It's, it's super beautiful. Um, students can go swimming and expect exploring while they're there as well. Next up, we have our marine conservation project in Belize and the scuba diving certification. This is a huge highlight. Students are basically traveling to a, a more or less private tiny little island or key as they call them off the coast of Belize, um, working with an organization that does mar marine science and conservation here, particularly looking at lionfish as an invasive species on the on the barrier reef here. This is the Mesoamerican barrier reef. It's the second largest in the world to the Great Barrier Reef. So students are not only getting scuba certified, but they're also helping to actually remove the lions, the lionfish from the barrier reef by like spear fishing. It's a really cool project. Okay, next up is our East Africa pro project, uh, East Africa program. This is a fall only semester. Uh, it travels to Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, and ends on Zanzibar, an island off the coast of Tanzania. So first up, we have our rhino sanctuary and homestay. So here, students are learning to track and monitor rhinos both day and night, working with local rangers and shadowing them and helping with rehabilitation efforts, um, as well as learning about what are the, you know, poaching and why are rhinos facing such endangerment in this part of the world. And then they also get to learn about uh, micro lending programs via a women's cooperative and seed lending bank while in a homestay with local families. Next up, moving on to Kenya, we do have a secondary academy and, and kind of school projects that we're doing here. So students are getting to basically pair up with this incredible girls school that we work with in in Kenya. Um, that's the I think it's Kenya's first free all all female secondary school. And they basically pair up with a girl and shadow them for the week. They take Swahili lessons, um, doing like English exchange programs and such, um, and really just learning about how these girls have ended up at this school um, over the years. Next up, we have Safari and the Maasai Mara. Um, students get to basically do a multi-day safari in one of the greatest game parks in the world, I would venture to say. Um, and and driving around looking for the big five. So that's elephant, cape buffalo, lion, leopard, and rhino. Um, students often see all five, not always, but it's really fun to try to spot them all. Um, and then we also have maybe one of my favorite projects that we have here at ARC is our solar energy um, power project, which is basically our partners in Kenya have been doing this project offering to install solar into homes that have never had access to electricity before. So our students do a full day solar workshop. They learn about solar energy, what they might need in their home to power their homes at home and such. And then they build and install these solar energy systems from the ground up and get to install them in someone's home and actually watch them turn the lights on for the first time. It's a pretty incredible experience. Next up is another public health project where students are basically shadowing nurses in a rural clinic to learn more about public health in the community. Um, so this is a community that actually focuses on snake bites, which is pretty cool. So learning more about, yeah, access to healthcare for these rural Maasai communities in Tanzania. And then they're also getting to help out at the Adult Education Center, um, which is just for the community. People can come and work on language skills. They can learn vocational training, computer skills, things like that. And next up, is, or last up, is Zanzibar. So students get to um, travel to the island of Zanzibar off the coast of Tanzania, um, explore Stone Town, uh, which is a beautiful little town with cobblestone winding streets, um, learn about more of the Muslim influence here, as well as it was a big port for during the slave trade. So students are getting to really look and dig into that and learn more about that and Zanzibar's significant history from that time period. Um, so really impactful stuff to look into. 
Um, Zanzibar is also known for its spices, so they get to do a spice tour and then just conclude with some beach time, hanging out, sort of rounding out the program and reflecting on all the experiences of the semester. Next up, we have our Pacific Islands program. This program travels to Indonesia and Fiji, and within Indonesia, it's Sumatra and Bali that they are traveling to. Um, this is a fall and spring semester, uh, so we are going to dig into some of the highlights now. First up is our orangutan project, um, conservation, and then the rice farming homestays. So for this project, this is in Sumatra. Students are working with a local NGO that is helping to protect um, the critically endangered orangutan. So they trek into the rainforest with, um, you know, in search of these in the wild, working with specialists and also learning about deforestation and how that is really impacting conservation of these, these um, animals in the rainforest. And then students are also doing a homestay in a local Sumatran home and really learning about, um, you know, rural farming, rice farming, uh, as you can see here, the, the, yeah, just really digging into all that that entails in rural Sumatra. Students then travel to another part of Sumatra for another kind of immersive opportunity in the Lake Toba region, which is a very different um, kind of indigenous group of people in Sumatra. They get to go kayaking on Lake Toba and then homestay in a coffee farming village, as pictured here. Those are actually coffee beans. That's what they look like when the fruit's on them. Um, and learn more about the coffee making process and how that is such an important export for Sumatra globally. And just learning more about the Batak people and um, you know, working in the community on any projects that are needed at that time. Next up is Bali. Students do get to take surf lessons while they are there. Um, and explore Ubud, which is, um, you know, kind of the cultural and, and spiritual hub of Bali, I would say. Um, and then they also get to learn about, you know, traditional water purification uh, ceremonies and what those mean for the people of Bali. So also kind of comparing and contrasting the, uh, you know, cultural traditions of Sumatra and Bali, both in Indonesia, but different places with different, different backgrounds. Next up is our social enterprise experience, and this is where students are basically working with a local organization that is, is partnering with a number of different social enterprises. So learning about the importance of those um, in the community, locally for Bali, as well as just understanding kind of different ways to go about social enterprise. So they might women, visit a women's cooperative, um, look at an organic farming farm to table, you know, farm to fork type of experience. Um, students also have visited like waste management places. So just learning about a lot of different social enterprises in Bali. Next up, we have coral reef restoration and scuba diving. This will happen in Fiji. So students are learning about, um, you know, the importance of coral reefs and, and understanding coral bleaching. They get to go out and do some monitoring of the coral reefs around various Fijian islands. Um, and then also get PADI scuba certified. So this is another program with scuba certification for students um, on the program. All right, next up we have our Southeast Asia program, this is a fall and spring program, so students can participate in this one in either time. Um, so highlight here for sure is our monastery stay. Students do get to dig into the great, you know, practice of meditation, learn more about Buddhism and its importance in the, the all, you know, culture and traditions of Thailand. And then they also get to take Muay Thai lessons. Um, so kind of learning about fighting and traditional Muay Thai in Thailand. Next up, we have our Nature Reserve and Elephant Conservation Project. So this is basically an, an organization that has set up a totally sustainable community living somewhat off the grid here, um, learning about the, the human elephant conflict. So, you know, there's wildlife corridors. How can we ensure the safety of elephants that need to pass through those within Thailand? Um, and then also visit a Thai, an elephant sanctuary where they have taken elephants that have been maybe in logging camps or trekking camps or who were not being um, really treated properly and uh, help care for them, you know, learn more about conservation of elephants in Thailand. Next up, we have another rice field, you know, homestay experience, rural farming community in Thailand that students really get to immerse themselves in, um, you know, working in the rice field, getting really dirty. I know when I was there personally, we had a mud fight, you know, this kind of, you know, where you're, you're in the mud, you're really getting in the thick of it and learning about farming in rural Thailand. And then students are also getting to go to Koh Tao, one of the islands off the coast of Thailand for their scuba certification course. So this is another fun, fun program where students are getting to get their scuba certification while here um, and learn more about marine conservation as well. Next up, we have a sort of um, 
you know, classroom assistants, more like a, an educational exchange where students are, are working with students, um, you know, providing some classroom support um, or extracurricular activities, um, shadowing and, and learning through that. And then one of our, you know, kind of big projects or opportunities on this program is our, we have an organization that we partner with that works with veterans of what they refer to as the American War and learn more about their stories um, and the background there as well. And then students get to go kayaking and exploring in Lanha Bay. So more of the fun experience. And um, they get to overnight in a junk here as well, which is a traditional, a traditional Vietnamese boat. Um, but uh, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So really cool experience. And then finally, we have Cambodia, which is our clean water filters project, as well as visiting Angkor Wat. So um, basically, this is an opportunity, another one of my favorites, along with the solar energy. I think this is such a great sustainable project. Students are building and installing um, biosand water filters for, uh, for homes that have never had access to clean water before. It's actually for communities. They last up to 40 years. It's a really amazing and impactful project. And then students do get to also watch sunrise over the, the ancient ruins of Angkor Wat. Okay, I'm gonna be a little bit over time here, folks, but I'm gonna to hope to finish this up within an hour. We've got two, a couple more semesters to finish up. Next is our Himalaya program. This program travels to India and Nepal. And this right now is going to be launching again in spring 2024. So a year from now, we'll, we will be restarting this program. Um, and then thereafter, it will probably be a fall program as well. So students get to spend time, a good chunk of time in Nepal with their, they start in Kathmandu, um, learning some basic Nepali phrases with Nepali um, language courses, as well as doing some culture and Nepalese cooking classes. They get to visit Bhaktapur, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and do a guided tour of that, as well as doing homestays with um, Nepal, Nepalese families just outside of Kathmandu, and working on some projects and farming and such in that community as well, sort of informal, but more of an immersive experience. Next up, another program where students are getting to learn a bit more about Buddhism during a monastery stay. This is actually a monastic institute, so um, they have young children who are learning to become monks here, and so students are getting to learn about meditation, the history of Buddhism, things like that as well. Um, and then they also get to do an overnight backpacking trek through the, the Himalayas. Um, it's the Annapurna circuit that they're doing, um, the Poon Hill Loop outside of uh, Pokhara, Nepal. So. Um, a multi-day backpacking experience here. This is one of our only programs with overnight backpacking. Next up, students are in the Ladakh region of northern India, which is the Himalayas of India, really. So very, very much more of a Tibetan influence than what you picture of, of what more southern India, what the culture and, and everything is like. But um, students are getting to work with a really awesome organization here that is doing snow leopard um, Conservation, to be clear, you probably won't see a snow leopard. They're incredibly elusive, but it's an awesome organization that's working on the, the conservation of those. And then in southern India, students are um, working at a, at a sloth bear sanctuary, um, as well as somewhere for rescued elephants. So um, a lot of wildlife conservation on this program as well. Also, if you haven't seen sloth bears, they're very cute. <laughs> Um, next up, just more generally for Southern India, students do get to spend time in Delhi, um, just exploring. They do a guided tour of all the major sites and historic landmarks of Delhi, um, as well as traveling to Agra, which is where the, the Taj Mahal is located. This is also where that sloth bear and elephant sanctuary is located, is outside of Agra. But um, they get to visit the, the Taj Mahal and do a guided tour as well um, of the Taj, one of those quintessential can't-miss landmarks. And then students travel down to the southern coast of India near Goa, where they do um, surfing projects, or I'm sorry, they do surfing lessons as well as presenting their capstone project, um, rounding out sort of with some beach time here as well. Super beautiful. Okay, our South America program travels to Chile and Patagonia as well as Peru. If you're looking at this spring 2023, we are traveling to Ecuador instead of Peru. So if you'd like more information about that, please contact us. We can get you that info. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to talk about the, the typical itinerary here, which is Peru and Patagonia. Also to note, this is typically a fall and spring program. So um, major highlights in Peru, obviously Machu Picchu being one of those quintessential landmarks, um, you know, wonders of the world type of a thing. You get to take a train through the Andes um, and through the Sacred Valley to visit Machu Picchu. They do sunrise at the ruins, um, as, as well as a guided tour to learn more about the, the history of the Incan people here. Um, and then we also have a really awesome llama conservation project where students are learning more about 
basically it's the use of llamas as the sustainable use of llamas as pack animals in the Andes. Um, so it's, you know, encouraging sustainability, not only for the mountains and ecosystems, for the animals, as well as for economic empowerment for communities to be able to work in tourism with that. So really awesome project there and students kind of trek up into a remote community for it. Um, then they go to Lake Titicaca where students are doing a homestay kind of on the shores of Lake Titicaca. This is the largest high altitude lake in the world, I think, or yeah, I believe that that is the, the, the term for it. Um, and it borders Bolivia too. So it's, it's really big and super beautiful. So students are not only doing a homestay, but also learning about um, the, the famous or the historic Uros people, which are, they live on these um, floating islands in the middle of the lake, the lot of Totoro reeds. So students are learning more about that. And then students also get to settle into a homestay while taking language classes in Peru. So another program where they're getting to dig more into that Spanish language study. Next up is our South America program, or I'm sorry, is our whitewater rafting. So this is now in Patagonia. So that kind of wrapped up the Peru section. Now we are in Patagonia. Um, students get to go whitewater rafting on the Fudulafu River, which is, you know, turquoise water. Super beautiful, some fun, you know, class three, maybe class four rapids, as well as do a day of, of flat water kayaking on the Fudulafu. Um, learning about, you know, hydroelectric dams in Chile, a very controversial issue. Um, students also get to visit Parque Patagonia, where they, which is um, the most recent national park in Chile that was donated by um, Christine Tompkins, uh, if you're familiar, the, her late husband founded the North Face. So um, really interesting issues around, and, and conversations to be had around con conservation in Patagonia with that. Um, and then they also get to spend some time on a permaculture farm and learn more about organic farming, permaculture, and sustainability. And then students get to do a multi-day backpack. This is the only other program, this in the Himalaya program, and the only ones with overnight backpacking. But students get to do an over a five-day trek through Torres del Paine National Park in Patagonia, um, which is one of the most beautiful backpacks I've ever personally done. It's absolutely stunning. And then students get to do a sort of language exchange program with high school peers at the local high school in Puerto Natales, Chile. Um, and they are in homestays, so they're kind of walking to school with their homestay siblings. Um, and then doing some English language exchange, giving these students the opportunity to practice English with native speakers, while our students also get to practice Spanish with native speakers. Okay, last up, thank you for bearing with me. Hopefully we'll just go a couple minutes over, but our Western Mediterranean program is our newest gap semester. Super excited to have more info here for you about that. It is traveling to Spain, Morocco, and Portugal. And this program is a fall only semester as of, this, as of now, we might add it for spring, depending on how things go um, and how, you know, how uh, in demand it is. But right now we're starting at fall 2023. We're very excited about it. Students here are going to get to do both Spanish and Moroccan Arabic courses. So while in Spain, in Sevilla, they're getting to um, dig into Spanish language while exploring Sevilla as well. And then they'll also get to do homestays in Morocco's capital of Rabat and take um, the Moroccan Arabic is Darisha. So students get to take Darisha lessons while they're there as well. So if you like language, they also speak French in Morocco. You also travel to Portugal. There's a lot of languages touched on in this program, but those are the only formal classes. Um, students do get to take surf lessons on Spain's southern coast um, and kind of t t spend some coast time in the south of Spain. Um, and then they're also going to get to do an overnight Saharan desert adventure. So traveling south, you know, while in Morocco, which are very different places, obviously, but two kind of more fun highlights, um, students will get to travel south of Marrakesh into the Sahara desert and do an overnight. Um, while in rural uh, Spain, students are doing a, they're basically getting to immerse themselves in an eco village in the Spanish countryside in the Andalusia, um, you know, countryside area of Spain. So learning more about um, organic farming, biodigesters, seed saving, composting toilets, gray water systems, super immersive experience there. It's also close to the largest concentration of greenhouses in the world. So students get to visit that and sort of learn more about that uh, somewhat controversial large conglomerate of greenhouses. And then they're also doing a food waste project that's actually going to be in Porto, Portugal, um, which is taking, uh, you know, still edible leftovers from restaurants and grocery stores and, and kind of hygienically repackaging them and delivering them to houseless or, um, you know, underprivileged folks in the area. So learning about that as well. Um, students get to immerse themselves in a community stay in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. So a super rural community pictured here. 
um, learning about uh, you know farming and uh, oh gosh they grow all sorts of things here um, and they do a lot of like native tree reforestation as well um, students will get to help on various infrastructure projects within the community and then they also get to work with another organization that is actually doing um, they're, they're planting saplings of various native fruit trees that they're growing and giving to folks in the area that not only are good for carbon offsetting and tree planting but also provide economic income for those folks that they can grow the fruit from these and sell them all right super excited about that new program we appreciate you all sticking with me it seems we had a couple of questions that came through during the presentation so i'm going to go ahead and answer those now um, there was a question about the application process and deadlines for that. So basically for the application process, it is a multi-step process, as I mentioned, where basically if you log on to the upper right-hand corner of any of our web pages, there is a red Enroll Now button. And that is where you can submit the initial application for the program. Um, pretty quick, it's just general info, uh, you know, name, contact info, what program you're applying for. You can also there submit the $800 deposit to officially hold your space on the program. Next up there is, we would send you the next steps in the application process, which does include uh, a detailed application, which is just a series of short answer questions so that we can start getting to know the students a little bit better. Um, and then we have two to three reference forms. So ideally it is one character and one academic reference. And then we do have one mental health reference, as I mentioned, for any student who's seen a mental health professional in the last four years. Then we, after we've received all those materials back, we would reach out to set up an interview and thereafter we would send official acceptance. All right, there was a question about food and water. So on our domestic programs, as well as East Africa Gap, students are actually cooking for themselves for a vast majority of the program. Uh, so they're learning about like shopping and, and cooking for a group and budgeting and all that, which is good life skills. Otherwise, food is all prepared and provided locally by our in-country partners, and students will be eating the local cuisine of the re region that they're traveling in. Um, and water, we either have bottled water or we are purifying water along the way to um, save bottles, especially on our international programs. So we do chat about that more in our handbook and preparation materials for the programs. Let's see, we had a question about references. Yes, 100%, we have alumni references. We'd love to put you in touch with them. They are the best resource to learn more about our program. So just ask us if that is something that you are interested in. Um, let's see, there was a question about accommodations. So also on our domestic programs, um, as well as the East Africa program, students are camping on all of those programs, um, camping and cooking for themselves. Otherwise, on the rest of the programs, basically students are in a mixture of you know, hostels or hotels when they're in major city centers. They might be in homestays on the international programs um, or, you know, basic community lodging for some of those rural communities where they're doing projects. Let's see here. We had a question about can you do fall and spring with ARC? Yes, absolutely. If you wanted to do two semesters with us, that is why we have two different semester options. Um, you could do fall or spring or both depending on how you are structuring your year. And if you're curious about sort of, you know, how you might want to structure your year and such, you can always reach out to us and we are happy to answer any of those questions for you. Let's see here. There was another question about political context. Um, you know, of course, that's, as I mentioned, we had to pivot our spring program from Peru to Ecuador due to the political, um, you know, civil unrest that's going on in Peru. So we are always ready to, to change our itineraries or you know do those sorts of things as needed throughout um, we do work with our in-country partners to monitor what's happening we also register all of our students with the state department step program which is the smart travelers enrollment program so if anything comes up and we need to pivot an itinerary we are more than happy to do so and ready and willing at any point Let's see here we had a question just about what do colleges think of the gap year that's a great question and i think anymore it is becoming more and more an accepted thing where students are uh, not only accepted but really celebrated by some colleges where they want you to take a gap year they they encourage it um you know it is often encouraged that students kind of apply to college during their senior year so that they you know while you're in the mindset and have those resources available to you with your counselors and such um kind of get your applications in and then you can defer for a year push it back for that one year then on your gap year you're not needing to worry about college applications so that is what's often recommended but you can of course reapply to colleges on your gap year if you so desire um that is always an option all right i think that that was all that we have so i hope that you all have gotten a good sense of our programs 
Um, we're just at an hour, so only 10 minutes over. But if you would like to learn more, there are a number of ways to do so. You can check out our website there. We have journals, videos, maps, blogs, all sorts of additional information that you can, can receive there. You can always call the office and ask to speak with the GAP director. Ask us for those alumni references. We're always happy to provide those. Um, we do have financial aid resources on the website as well as that we can provide here in our office as well. So definitely feel free to re reach out at any point. But thank you again for participating in the webinar. I know how crazy school nights can be, so we really appreciate it. Mara will stay online to answer questions as long as people have them. But if something comes up thereafter or when we're done, just feel free to give us a call. Otherwise, we hope we'll see you for one of our upcoming gap semesters. Good night, everyone.